I'm going to share my scriptitude screen. This is all the right. part where we all sing the theme song. Uh, <laughs> all right. Here we go, setting up, redirecting to YouTube. All right, everyone sing their favorite uh, game show theme song. And welcome to Scriptitude. That was fast. All right. So um I'm Oh dear Lord. Okay. So if anyone's got uh, YouTube going live, turn down the sound. It'll confuse the heck out of you. All right. So welcome to Scriptitude. Um, and this is something that I'm going to hand over to Wayne, who has some opening remarks. My name is Mike Boas. We have a whole cast of characters here. But Wayne Coglin, take it away. Hi. Good evening. I'm Wayne Coglin. I'm the chairman and CEO of the Rochester Association for Film Arts and Sciences. And I want to welcome you all to the second annual Rafa's Scriptitude table reading event. Uh, this year's table reading event and the Scriptitude contest was sponsored by Script Studio. Shameless plug. Script Studio is a complete creative writing software package for screenwriters, playwrights, and novelists. It's a tool set that takes your initial idea from concept to outline to character development to structuring your narrative to professionally formatted scripts. So check it out at www scriptstudio.com. End of shameless plug. Uh, tonight, we'll be reading the three scripts that graded out as the best of the entries we received. Now, before we begin, I'd like to make a few announcements. I'd like to thank our panel of judges, Mike Boas, Sean Essler, and Joanne Casey for all their work. They have years of experience with screenwriting have had many of their own scripts filmed. I'd also like to thank Two Sues Casting, Susan Azer, for assembling this fine pool of talent. Also, Mike Boas for making tonight's YouTube live event possible and all the actors for donating their time. I wanna mention our next event, the Schmovies Film Festival. This year's event will be the sixth time we've presented a short film program at a local venue. Be on the lookout on Film Freeway, Facebook, Twitter, and email for dates, rules, and submission forms. And now without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mike Boas who will be your guide through the table reads. Mike? Uh -huh. Thank you, Wayne. Okay, so um, we are going to be doing uh, three scripts tonight, and we're going to kick it off with Concrete the Deep uh, by Jason Terrell. Um, and I'm going to say, uh, yeah, we will come back and talk to Jason after, uh, afterwards. We'll do a little Q&A with him. And um, let's see here. We want to introduce our actors for, uh, for that piece. So why don't we go, um, let's see here. I'll keep it on speaker, uh, I'm sorry, on, uh, on, on uh, what do you call it, the, the speaker view while we introduce everyone. And uh, Sean, you were going to introduce our actors. Yes, I am. I, uh, I have the list right up here on my screen. Uh, for Concrete the Deep, uh, we have, as Justine, we have Catherine Fudge. As Karen, we have Amelia Favata. Hey. As Tagger, we have Alex Packard. As Spencer Cohn slash leader, we have Ken Rhodes. As thug number one, Mike Boas. All as right. As thug right. number two, Sean Essler. <laughs> and as the deep one, we got Bridget Yax Yaxley. Very good. Uh, oh, and I should say to anyone watching, if uh, they want to uh, comment or send in some uh, questions on the YouTube comments, uh, you can do that uh, and we'll be monitoring that. Um, all right, very good. Um, I guess. Take it away, Wayne, with our, uh, our action lines. Okay, concrete the deep. Interior bug jar, evening. Justine, 22, in faded black jeans, hoodie, and SWAT-style boots, sits at a far booth with her friend Karen, 22, who is dressed similarly, but a hint more fashionable. Karen talks excitedly, both out loud and in ASL. I got it. We fill the air with, get this, flying fish. Justine looks at her friend oddly. What? Justine silently judges her friend. What? Don't judge me. Fine. What amazing plans do you have later? Justine just smiles and takes a long sip of her beer. 
Karen follows the pause and takes a drink herself. Justine smiles, taking on a Cheshire quality. She speaks without signing. Sign captioning appears below her. I'm going to war. Karen raises an eyebrow. War? Justine pinches her brow and then continues out loud in ASL. Some fucker messed with one of my pieces in the deep. You gotta stop going down there. It's scary. There's cannibal hobos and scary monsters with big eyes and teeth down there. That's because it's just the portal to hell. Quit joking. You quit being a pussy. But I'm a cute little pussy. That you are, but also why I go by myself. I know how to fight people, the zombies and the mole people. Justine pauses, considering her next request. But I would love to take one of your pre-rolls, if you got a spare, <laughs> to calm my nerves. Karen looks vindicated while pulling a nicely rolled joint from a silver case. Not so tough now. Here. I don't know how this helps. I'd be way too paranoid. Justine shrugs. Fade two. Exterior tunnel entrance, day. Justine soaks in the sun before steering her gaze toward the abandoned subway tunnel known as the Deep. She pauses, lights the joint using a mini torch, then marches into the pitch blackness. Interior tunnel entrance, day, then dark. Justine takes one look back toward the sunlight, then pushes on. Interior, the Deep, dark gallery. The tunnel is long. She passes one giant mural, then another. The tunnel seems to go on forever. Graffiti of every nature litters every surface. It's like a post-apocalyptic art gallery that never ends. Interior of the deep, the arches. Justine emerges into a sunlit portion of the tunnel. Old open arches light up the area. Three artists are working on their skills, ignoring Justine as she walks past. She reaches the edge of the light without pause. One of the taggers notices and yells out. Yo. Yo, you don't want to go down there. He continues without pause, as if she didn't hear him yell. Yo, dude. Hey, shit, it's your grave. The tagger shrugs, then gets back to his work. Interior, the deep. Scary deep. A red light headlamp turns on, barely illuminating Justine. She walks cautiously, knowing the danger back here. Deeper still, she creeps along, carefully scanning the shadow for trouble. Interior, the deep, wall of violence. Up ahead, barrel fires burn while shadows dance around. Justine keeps to the dark as she creeps up. Loud music echoes across the walls. From Justine's perspective, it's two skinhead punks thrashing around in silence. And the original asshole, back again, defacing her pieces some more. The artist is a Richard Spencer clone, even wearing an out of place suit who is adding a badly painted picture of a man giving a Nazi salute in front of the woman image he had already defaced previously. After finishing what resembles an eggplant extending from the hips, the Spencer clone stands back to admire his work. He grabs a bottle from one of his dancing friends and takes a large swig. Then he motions for them that it's time and they all head out. Justine waits and waits then slowly emerges and walks toward her ruined work. Saying nothing, she looks at the wall in disgust. She speaks out loud. Time to improvise. Stencils and spray cans come out. In freestyle, she paints a shogun first, wielding a ray gun pointed at the ugly Nazi's head. Then comes the laser beam shooting at the offender. Just as Justine moves onto the head, there is a sound and slight movement behind her. She doesn't notice while in the zone. She turns the target head into one that is, that's exploding. Justine stands back to admire her work so far until a crazed body rushes toward her and strikes her with a pipe. Justine goes down. The first guy is joined by another and the two start kicking repeatedly and hard. All Justine can do is curl up and absorb the kicks as best she can. The kicking stops. One of the thugs grabs her arm from the behind just as a third pair of boots walk up to Justine. You must be a fucking idiot. As he bends down, showing a cruel young face. This is my turf, and now I'm going to fuck you up permanently for invading. He grabs Justine's hoodie with one hand and yanks down the mask and hood, revealing her face. Oh shit, it's a fucking girl. 
From Justine's point of view, we watched the Spencer clone talking, but all is silent now. The closed captioning is broken up. <coughs> Justine can't take it any longer and yells out. You. The guys look stunned at Justine's accent. Oh shit, are you fucking deaf? The other thug walks up beside her and snaps his fingers behind her. She's some kind of retard. Oh, fuck yeah, we're gonna fuck a deaf dumb girl. Spence, the Spencer gets right in her face. We're gonna fuck you up, and then we're going to destroy everything you've ever put up. Justine looks oddly calm. Everything eventually gets destroyed, even you. She suddenly snaps her head back into the guy holding her, bashing his nose. Stunned, he lets go. Justine grabs a handful of dirt and throws it at the Spencer clone and the second thug. As they are momentarily blinded, Justine grabs one of her spray cans, pulls out the mini torch and sprays fire at the gang. The guys scamper away fast until the Spencer clone pulls the gun out and shoots Justine in the head. She flies back and hits the ground. Oh fuck, you killed her. The Spencer bends down to look. There's a bloody wound along the side of her head, but otherwise she's stunned. Fucking lucky. I grazed her. Hold her arms down. As Justine is stirring awake, Thug One pins her arms above her head while the Spencer straddles her at the waist. Thug Two dances around, too excited to see the large disc-like eyes appear behind him. As the Spencer is bending down to gloat over Justine, the dancing thug stops moving because the dark tendrils have attached themselves to him. I'm going to rip you open and every- Guys, help! The Spencer and Thug One look up just as Thug Two is becoming painfully absorbed by the darkness under the large glowing eyes. Thug Two tries calling out one last time before he disappears from sight. Help! The Spencer stands up, gun drawn, and fires into the darkness until the gun is empty. The eyes don't move. Thug One lets go of Justine and starts running away. Fuck this. Justine slides away from them. Spencer backs off until he freezes in place as he hears his friend screaming in pain. Ah, no, 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 please. No, I'm not like this. No. Ah. Then silence, except for the sound of the Spencer's shuffling feet. In fear and rage, he turns on Justine. Did you do this? Did you do this? The Spencer begins to advance on Justine until another set of eyes appears behind her. He freezes, truly scared once more. The first deep one comes up behind him. The tendrils attach themselves. The leader cries as the darkness slowly absorbs him. No, please, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Just I'm sorry. slides back against the wall with the art. The deep ones stare down at her. Justine stares back in fear, pressed against the wall. The deep ones shift their gaze at the reworked painting beside her. Justine also looks, now getting confused. The closest deep one looks back at Justine. Black alien-like hands stretch out of its body. The hands speak in ASL. Did you do this? Justine can't believe the thing just asked her a question. Her hands stutter out a response. Uh, yes, I'm fixing it. The deep one looks at the work again, then looks at Justine. It's okay. Still terrified, Justine is also a little stunned and insulted. It's not finished. Then you should finish it. The deep ones fade back into the dark. Justine trembles in place, too confused and scared to move. She looks back at her work, takes a deep breath, then forces herself to move. In no time flat, stencils are placed over the girl and sprayed over. The final results are not revealed. Justine quickly packs up her cans and stencils and hastily begins running away. Interior, the deep, dark gallery. Justine moves from one area of the tunnel to the next and next and picks up her pace as she sees the light at the end. As she gets closer, she can't help but break into a run, looking back occasionally. <laughs> Exterior, tunnel entrance, day. Justine emerges from the tunnel. The daylight bathes her face in its light and she feels glorious and then collapses on the ground, sobbing. This continues for several seconds until it turns into hysterical laughter. After a bit, she calms down enough to say out loud, Everyone's a fucking critic. <laughs> the last remnants of laughter burst out again until she sighs with relief. Fade to black.
little more, Sean, uh, Wayne. Huh? There's oh, an have... additional page you missed. <laughs> there. I, I'll take it. In the deep, dark gallery, as the credits roll, soft, introspective piano plays as the two deep ones study various works of art in the tunnels. Toward the end, the deep ones study Justine's finished work. The piece is transformed into something positive. The deep one continues to simply gaze until we once more fade to black. All right, how about a round of applause for our actors? All right. Uh, one thing, uh, I would like to introduce Joanne, who I don't know if we've introduced by pers as in person yet. Joanne uh, is going to lead a little talk here with uh, Jason. Uh, Joanne is on mute right now. I'm, okay. I'm off. All right. There we go. Hi, all. Hey, Joanne. So um, let's see what we got. First off, Justin, Jason, sorry. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how long you've been writing screenplays? Uh, well, hello. Um, yeah, so I'm Jason Terrell and uh, I've been writing screenplays actually only for a few years, uh, maybe the past uh, eight years, I guess. Um, but uh, when I moved out to Connecticut, I, I uh, actually wrote a screenplay about roller derby and zombies. And that's kind of what started me down this path. And uh, so, yeah, here I am today. Uh, and uh, again, thank you for uh, selecting my script, guys. Awesome. So uh, what inspired you to write Concrete the Deep? Two things, actually. Um, one is, and uh, actually, a, a, a book that I read recently. Uh, so, uh, well, actually, I, I'm a big fan of street art, if it's not obvious in the story. Uh, and I was at one point just doing a, a live research on Banksy, uh, just seeing what something, you know, something more I could read on him. And I discovered this young adult novel uh, called Your Welcome Universe by Whitney Gardner. And the main character is this deaf girl uh, who's also a, a street artist. And as much as I wanted to, I could not do an adaptation of that. And so, I just, I was obsessed about this, this deaf character who's a street artist. And likewise, um, I, I've also always been obsessed with, you know, things like paranormal phenomena. And, and I just found myself merging the two together and hence Concrete came about. Awesome, awesome. So this uh, question is actually from Mike. He's got, he gave me a couple questions. Um, <laughs> why? Why is it important to you tell a story about a deaf character? I don't know if there's an obvious answer for that. It, it just felt right. I, 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 I can't give it, I, I, I could give so many reasons why I, I do believe it's important that, you know, characters, you know, like deaf characters are very underrepresented. Uh, deaf actors are very upper underrepresented and so again when I discovered this book and discovered this you know the character from this book I, I it just was something that stuck in my head and I, I thought it would be a fascinating way to tell a story so that's how I rolled with it awesome so uh, this is another one from Mike he said the influence of HP Lovecraft is evident but yes. merged with modern characters and situations was there anything specific you drew on from Lovecraft or more, was it more thematic? Yeah, I, more thematic, yeah, yeah more thematic. Um, I, I am influenced by Lovecraft, but I think more as a concept. Uh, I've actually read more works that were Lovecraft inspired, like, uh, you know, the, oh God, I'm blanking on the name of it, but uh, Alan Moore wrote a large number of Lovecraft inspired stories that I've read. Um, Lovecraft himself, I mean, his concepts are great, but I have a hard time like really getting into his stories. So, uh, so yeah, um, definitely more thematic. What, uh, what storytelling challenges that might come up associated with having a deaf character, for instance, how to tell how do you tell the audience through filmmaking techniques that the character can't hear 
behind something, her, you know, beside, you know, behind her, or when she can or can't read lips. So I, I did present that in a few of the moments there. Uh, at one point when she's hiding from, uh, you know, from everyone, from the guys who are defacing her wall and dancing around, there, there's a moment where it's just, you can't hear, it's, it's just dead silent. Uh, same thing also when the Spencer clone is, is yelling right in her face and, you know, she's trying to read the, read the lips and, you know, I, I want, you know, the closed captioning is supposed to appear on the screen all broken up and everything. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that, uh, and this was something that I don't know if would ever be practical, but it was just a concept I thought of was something called what I'm calling sign captioning. Or like little pictograms, and I'm not even going to attempt to do it. The only sign I can do is that. But like a little pictogram of that, you know, which this is, thank you, uh, about the, the only sign I really know. <laughs> but uh, um, but I figured that, you know, something like that in place of like English titles would be a fascinating thing. And maybe like a respectful thing for deaf audience members. Um, I don't know. I, I, I need to ask people if, if that would actually be a good idea or not. All right. What what style or genre of screenplays do you prefer to write? Uh, you know, I, I do actually go for a variety of stuff. I, I do. I, I mean, I, I'm a sci-fi nerd uh, through and through, uh, but I, I do like to play around with that genre. Uh, I mean, I guess the story qualifies as more horror, but to me, it, it, I mean, Lovecraft was considered both a horror and a sci-fi writer. And that's kind of sort of where my mind just tends to drift is more speculative and you know and, and really can fit with anything whether it's a whether it's a drama whether it's an action piece it's you know it, it's just a fun genre for me to play with cool so i want to open up to any of the actors or uh, any of the uh, rafis staff here do you guys have any questions you'd like to ask jason well, actually, I, th I thought of something, uh, you know, when I first read the script. Uh, what is it about Justine, especially with her disability? Why would she go into such a dangerous place with her disability without any safeguards? I, I, I'm, I was trying to wonder that. I was wondering about that with her character. Yeah, I, and I, I, I debated that. I, 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 you know, originally, you know, I was talking about uh, her asking her friend originally to kind of be her, you know, like, to, to be there as her hearing companion. But at the same time, I thought I wanted more of a sense of danger about it. And, and also her really showing her daring. It, you know, that's not to say that she doesn't use precautions except for the moment when she's really absorbed in her painting, she forgets to keep looking around. Uh, but I, I, want, I wanted to really present her as she doesn't define herself by her disability. She defines herself as yeah, more as an artist and very and kind of maybe an overly defiant one too to her own detriment and doesn't necessarily think you know about just how dangerous that could be so even though she thinks that she understands that you know or even with all the great precautions that she does try to take okay any I other just, questions yeah i just want to bring something up um, you, if you're going to write a deaf character, you have to do a ton more research because everybody's sitting here saying her disability, her disability. They mm -hmm. do not view themselves as having a disability. No. They're differently it, abled. And I, you know what I mean? And so you have to be really careful about that. For example, just representing someone in a screenplay doesn't make it right. If there was a reason that you were showcasing her deafness as part of the story, that is an integral part that makes it different than the other girl going down that could hear. That that's something because then you're 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 doing something with 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 that ability that different ability that a person has. Just saying, okay, let's make her blind, let's make her deaf, let's make her left-handed. You know, anybody could play that part. So be be really careful about that, especially when you're talking about certain certain things like deafness where where the deaf community especially if you're from rochester it's very strong here and you know and they have very strong opinion my daughter just graduated the other day from rit and asl 
So I, I am, you know, she's gone through this whole thing for the last six years and it's, it's a different kind of thing. So you really should get a grasp of that because inadvertently you trying to write a good engaging story, you know, and you turn around, you wonder why people are standing outside your backyard with pitchforks and torches and everything else, you know? That's no, no, I can't argue with that one bit. I, I especially as you said knowing that you know here in rochester with rit uh and i just haven't had an opportunity and actually i'm sure that there's plenty of ways that i could reach out you know to the deaf community because i actually agree with you I, I, the book that influenced me that was actually one of the strong character arcs about her was that you know i mean she's given the option to, you know, to have like cochlear implants and such, and she outright refuses it because to her, that, that was, that is part of her identity and is and very proud of it. Very, and the thing is that I do understand mm -hmm. that I, 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 you're right. I, like when I, if I, if I did get a chance to film this, I don't want to cast this with a hearing actor uh, because I, I I don't want to screw it up, you know, and you're right. I don't want people with pitchforks at my doorstep. We're getting uh, some good comments uh, from the, uh, from our YouTube chat as well. Um, people saying thumbs up to that, Jason. And I think uh, the obvious thing to do if you do choose to shoot it is, uh, be, you know, take the step of having uh, some feedback from yeah. uh, uh, deaf actors or deaf uh, uh, representatives who can, uh, or like, uh, yeah, and I'm sure Wayne could even put you uh, in contact with some. Um, and uh, and we had another, uh, uh, let's see, someone, John Spencer said he loved the, the Cthulhu-like uh, theme, uh, which I guess is just the sort of general Lovecraft theme. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, Joanne, I think we could probably move on. We have, uh, you know, we have a, a, a pretty good audience here right now, but uh, not getting a lot of questions, but that's okay. Um, and uh, I'd say thank you very much, Jason. And right. uh, yep. I, th I yep. think it's, it's, it'll be a fun one to, fun one to shoot. And I encourage you to, to actually uh, take that next step. Yes. Yeah, good job, Jason. All right. thank you. Uh, okay. So let's see here. Let's uh, jump back to Sean. Sean, you can tell us who's up next in our next piece. That I can, but uh, I am noticing now Melody is on my screen, but I'm not sure I believe it. Melody, are you actually here? Yes. You're on your can you hear oh. me? We yes, hear I can. I, I'm very thankful to be able to hear you. Me too. <laughs> So we had, uh, for our audience, we had some trouble getting her on because I accidentally banned her from the group, but uh, we figured out how to get her back in. That's, that's terrific. All right, before I read the cast list, you wanna introduce uh, the next one there, Mike? Sure, so our next, uh, our next piece is called Still Watching. Um, and it's from uh, uh, writers Brian Vanderberg and Nick Pasqua Pasquarella, uh, who are both with us uh, here tonight. And, uh, it is uh, about, what is it, about 29, 30 pages. And uh, I won't say what it's about because we'll find out soon enough. Still watching uh, and take it away, Sean. All right, for still watching uh, in the role of a uh, Jason is Alex Packard. In the role of Chris is Kay Cody Hunt. As the uh, television narrator is Jeff Moon. As Kira is Melody Rorig. As uh, Emily is Amelia Favata as Heather is Catherine Fudge, and as the employee is Ken Rhodes. You ready? Sorry about that, I was muted. All right, uh, take it away, uh, Wayne. I'm gonna switch over to, um, I've already forgotten. Do I do gallery mode or speaker mode for this? I'll do gallery mode. How's that? Okay. There we go, go ahead. Fade in. Exterior, wedding venue day. We open on a stunning wedding ceremony. A bride and groom are situated neatly in the center of the frame. We hear a deep inhale as the scene dips to black. With the exhale, the scene returns, but the bride is speaking silently. The guests shift nervously in their seats. The scene fades again. Returning, we see there is no bride. The groom's head slumps down as the best man's hand rests on his shoulder. We hear one more inhale as the scene fades, fade in. 
Interior Jason's home, early morning. Jason, late 20s, rolls off a well-loved futon. As he does, some of the magazines, which are serving as its missing fourth leg, shifts with the weight. Following Jason around his town home, we see dishes piled high in the sink, stacks of mail and takeout containers by the trash can, and stark barren walls. There's two kitchen chairs, but no table. The TV sits on a stack of plastic totes. Jason's hair is matted in places and looks dirty. He's growing out a patchy beard, but is mostly growing out his stomach. He navigates his way past the spare bedroom where a dusty guitar sits untouched in a corner. He opens his bedroom closet where he chooses from one of two hanging shirts and pulls on an already tied tie. He heads to the garage and gets in a beat up gray sedan and drives away. Cut to interior coffee shop, day. Jason is sitting across from Chris, his friend at their local coffee shop, a daily tradition. I feel like it should be easier than it is, right? Yeah, it could be. Jason isn't really listening. Chris notices. Plus, last night when I was doing the dishes with famed police officer Alex Murphy, he mentioned to me that he generally likes his steak medium rare, which I thought is strange because he's a cyborg. What? You stop listening to me again. Who's officer Alex Murphy? That's what you took from what I just said? I heard you. Sure. I get it. Robocop. What? what? Alex Murphy is Robocop. Was I expected to know that even if I was listening? It's pretty disappointing to me that you don't. Jason laughs lightly and checks his watch. I gotta go. Emily and I are going to that new brewery tonight, if you're interested. I can't make it tonight. Jason. Christopher. It's been almost a year, man. Uh, what are you, Carl Calendar? Who the hell is Carl Calendar? A real Timmy timekeeper. Jay. Danny Date Knower. I'm just saying, time to rejoin the world of the living. Yeah, I know I do, all right? It's, I'm just not there yet. Okay. Okay. Still got your terrible humor? That's all I have left. That and the drinking. Cut to interior Jason's home evening. Jason walks in already eating out of a box of pizza. He pours himself a healthy glass of dark rum and sits on the futon as it settles into the magazines. He turns on his TV and opens the popular new streaming service, Shadow Media. Cheapest weddings, diva brides, love is blind, the bachelor. Thanks. That's awesome. What else does your algorithm want to roast me with tonight? Just as he says that, his phone vibrates on the couch. He looks at it, and it's a notification from the streaming service letting him know that the first season of something called Living the Dream was now available. Wow. I was just kidding. Jason turns his attention back to the TV when a trailer starts autoplaying annoyingly. Do what you've always wanted to do. Be who you've always known you could be. Over the course of this limited series, you'll experience what it's like to live the dream. There is a long pause. Nope. Jason turns off the TV and lays down on the couch, taking another big swig of rum. Please not tonight. Fade out. Interior Jason's home, night. Damn it. It's only 8.30 p.m. Jason looks in the fridge to find an impressive collection of takeout containers and sighs loudly. This is just embarrassing. Jason digs around and finds a box of mac and cheese. He starts to boil the water and moves trash around to sit on the counter. He grabs his phone and starts to scroll. He opens a social media app and we see that he has got a notification which brings up a photo from one year ago. It looks like an engagement photo. He puts the phone down angrily. Making his way to the living room, Jason drops hard onto the futon. As he does, the remote falls to the ground, just out of reach. Jason tries for it with his foot, but immediately gives up. The show he tried to avoid begins autoplaying. Welcome to Living the Dream, where we'll transport you to an incredible world. But be warned, if you start this journey, 
he might not be able to look away. Well, he can't reach the remote, so... Make sure you're ready for an exciting new episode every night. Because if you miss one, they're gone. This is a really long intro show. Tonight, we're looking into the life of a young man who is a year out of a devastating breakup. Jason quickly looks up at the screen to see a silhouette of someone similar to his shape. He looks nervously down at his glass of rum, then at the bowl of mac and cheese. We've seen where he's been, and we've seen where he is. But now, we'll take a look at just how Jason is living the dream. Upon hearing his name, he is staring at the TV transfixed as the silhouette slowly disappears. What? It... It's me. Just then, Jason's eyes close, seemingly not by his own accord, and the world dips to black. All is quiet. Fade in. Interior Jason's home early morning. Jason slowly wakes up but notices something different. Instead of a crappy futon, he was waking up on a nice and significantly more comfortable couch. As he starts to look around, he notices he's in his town home, but it's beautiful. The TV is mounted perfectly level on the wall. He stands up and feels the soft rug on his feet. There's a chair in the corner of the room. I have an accent chair? The kitchen area now featured a beautiful wooden table. He runs his hand over the neatly sanded finish. What is happening? The kitchen is clean and tidy. The fridge and cupboard stocked. Jason makes his way up the stairs to his bathroom where he catches his own reflection in the mirror. Shit. Are you kidding me? Jason laughs to himself as he sees a total transformation. His breakup body has shed all those additional pounds. His facial hair was neatly groomed and just for waking up, well, his hair looked awesome. He runs his hand through it. It's so soft. Montage. We see Jason getting ready. He showers, smelling each one of his designer products. His closet is stocked full of nice, clean clothing. He tries some on before putting on a dapper gray suit and ties a navy tie into a full Windsor knot. Interesting. Didn't even know I knew how to tie that knot. Or any. He's about to head downstairs when something in his spare bedroom catches his eye. End montage. No way. The room is filled with music equipment. There's a stunning mahogany Martin guitar sitting in the corner on a stand with more hanging from the hooks on the wall. On a computer screen, a virtual sticky note is open in the corner of the screen. Open mic night, Saturday the 16th. Jason looks at the guitars. Maybe. He picks a black fender from the wall and holds it in his hands. As he starts to play, the entire room fills with incredible music. Jason can't believe his ears or his eyes, which are transfixed on his hands, crushing this song. No fucking way. Feeling sufficiently satisfied, Jason heads downstairs to the garage. He puts on a pair of sunglasses and opens the door, revealing a jet black Tesla. You know what? That just feels right. Jason opens the garage door and heads in. The door closes. Cut to interior Jason's home early morning. Jason rolls off his futon, spilling mac and cheese on the floor. He looks down at himself, noticing his bulging stomach. He runs his hands through his hair, not soft. This sucks. He starts to pick up the mac and cheese with his hands when he accidentally grabs the remote. He stops. No, no, that's crazy, Jay. He points the remote and turns on the TV. The series page for Living the Dream is still up. He tries to click on episode one, but nothing happens. Instead, there's just a check mark next to the word completed. Okay, next episode? He tries to click more episodes, but a timer pops up, counting down from 24 hours. 24 hours, huh? Jason recalls what the narrator said. If you miss one, they're gone. Well, well, what am I supposed to do until then? Go back to work? Cut to interior coffee shop day. Jason and Chris are seated in their usual spot. The show was about you? Or, or like you related to one of the characters? No, dude, the show was literally about me. D didn't you say you fell asleep like immediately? So what? So it was very clearly a dream 
and not a show all about you, seeing as that's insane. Dude, I'm not crazy. Yeah, sure you're not. I'll prove it to you. Uh-huh. Jason pulls out his phone and opens up the streaming service. He clicks on the show page and holds it up. It's a bad reality show. You're not even anywhere in the trailer. You were also never in a TV show. Just forget it. I feel like I know who's responsible for this. It was a pirate captain. You might know him. Goes by the name of Morgan. Oh, you're a dick. You've been cursed. Jason looks unamused. Come on. How can I not make fun of you for having a rum-fueled fantasy? Hey, I got an idea. Let's never talk about it again. Fine. So you uh, ready for your part next week? What's next week? I'm proposing. Right. Still going through with that. Wow. Who's the dick now? Sorry. I bet. I mean, luckily, during the planning meeting when you were inhaling wings, the rest of us gave you as little responsibility as possible. All you have to do is show up at nine that Friday and be where we tell you to be. Lighting fireworks, man. I'm not worried about it. You're releasing lanterns. Even better. Just be there. I'll be there. We're playing poker tonight. Beer, pizza. You can give me all your money. Yeah, yeah, I, I might make it. There's a brief pause where neither of them say anything. So you were like really good at the guitar? Jason slams his head on the table. Cut to interior Jason's home night. Jason is standing in front of the TV watching the countdown. He paces back and forth. It's about 9 p.m. He looks at and ignores the text from Chris asking him about poker. As the timer expires, Jason makes a sort of wish. Show me a better life. Jason presses play. On episode two of Living a Dream, things start to heat up for Jason as he comes face to face with... During the narrated intro, Jason's eyes close, fade in, interior restaurant night. Jason is sitting alone at a table in a very upscale restaurant. He is startled by his phone vibrating with a text from someone named Kira. The text reads, walking in. He starts to respond back when he hears the sound of a bell on the door ring. He looks up toward the sound and it is immediately awestruck. Kira, a brunette woman in a raincoat, enters like a whirlwind. She catches his gaze and smiles. Hi. Uh... Conference so late in the afternoon for anything other than emergency. Why don't people think? I, I'm, I'm not. It pushed everything back. I mean, we all have to run around. And, and for what? Because you can't strategize correctly and the rest of us have to rush to get a reaction quote and file? You're a reporter? Kira takes a pause for a moment and looks up at Jason. You're being weird. Did you order yet? Uh, no, not yet. Just then, a waiter walks over and places two plates on the table. Waiter? He was muted. Take it again, Sean. Yep. Caesar salad and the bacon wrapped scallops? Uh, just those. Can I get you something to drink, ma'am? Your house red, please. As the waiter walks away, Kira looks puzzled. Okay, let's pretend like you're not acting super strange. Jason starts to catch up to her speed. Sure, but how will we circle that square once the apps are gone? Didn't you hear me order wine? I heard you not order two. Well, I figured you already not ordered for yourself. Maybe I did. Jason points at something on Kara's plate. Hey, can I have one of those? This is my last one and the only thing I've had to eat today since I had a half a protein bar, which was like seven hours ago. Why only half? Tasted weird. Halfway through? <laughs> no, from the beginning, but thought maybe we'd get better. We can split this if you want. No, it's all yours. Been together two years and you're still a keeper. Jason catches himself staring. The effects of this 
binge world are weighing heavily on his emotions. Just as he's about to say something, Kiera begins to hum a tune softly as she reads the menu. The music strikes him immediately. Hey, what is that? Kiera doesn't look up from the menu. What is what? That song you're humming. Funny. I'm serious. It's your song. My song? Yes, your song. The one you were singing the night we met. The one you like to say you wrote for me. Even though we had never met. And that's also a highly suspect line. How awesome am I that I wrote you a song even before meeting you? <laughs> I'll let you answer that one. I think I'm going to get the salmon. What are you going to get? As she continues humming, as he keeps staring, she doesn't look up, but she notices. What are you doing, Jay? I just don't want this episode to end. Episode? Are you having a stroke? <laughs> no, I mean, um, this episode, this, this chapter of our lives. Weird. That's sweet. Which is oddly how this pork sounds. That's what I was going to get. Too slow. We can get the same thing? Nope, because if we get the same thing and I don't like the pork, I won't have anything else to eat. Awesome. It's worked out really well for me. Didn't it, though? They keep talking and laughing as the scene begins to fade out. Jason is smiling more than he ha ever has. Cut to interior Jason's home night. Jason rolls off the futon and some more of the magazines holding it up shift. He pumps his fist in joy, smiling big. I have to get back in. I need, I need more time with her. Jason pulls up the show page and the timer for the next episode is present again. 23 hours in between each episode? Okay, I can make it. it it's just one day at a time. She's worth it. One day at a time. Montage. We see scenes of Jason pacing back and forth, slavishly waiting for 9 p.m. to play the next episode every night. We see Chris sitting alone at the coffee shop day after day, looking at his watch and checking his phone with no messages. Chris sends a text reminding him, 9 p.m. Friday night. We see Jason rushing in and out of his job. His appearance starts to worsen. He wears the same thing for days at a time and becomes a shut-in just waiting for the next episode. We now see Jason in the world of the show. He plays music with Kiara, always in the audience. He goes to work at a modern office and drives his nice car. More than anything, we see Jason with Kira. They go on various dates, laughing together and having a blast. They play board games, they watch fireworks, and they explore the city. Night after night, we see him fall head over heels in love with her. End montage. Interior, Jason's home night. It's 8.55 p.m. and we see Jason, hair totally wild, stains on his shirt. He's holding the remote and his phone. As the countdown expires, he presses play as a look of horror washes over his face. Oh shit, it's Friday, Chris. As he says that, his eyes shut as he enters the show. Cut to interior coffee shop day. The next day, Chris is sitting in their normal booth alone as Jason bursts in, still with his hair a mess and wearing the same stained clothes. He has heavy bags under his eyes and people around him turn their heads. He clearly smells. Chris, I, I am so, so sorry, dude. I, I don't even know what to say, okay? I, I lost track of time, and I got caught up in my show, and, and there's no excuse. I know that. It's just, it's been a really hard time, okay? I, I actually got fired the other day, so I, I don't know what I'm going to do about that. But like I said, there's no excuse, man. I'm so sorry. How did it go? What did she say? Chris sits silently. Chris. No response. Look, I get that you're mad. You deserve to be, but... I was there the more. moment you got your heart broken. I have been there for you every moment in the year since. I have asked you for nothing in return other than for you, my best friend, to be there when I proposed to my fiancé. But no, you only care about you, and you let that what happened poisoned your life so completely that you've defaulted to this pathetic, poor me persona that everyone is just so tired of. You've been binging a fucking show? That's your excuse. It's so much more than a show. 
the only good thing in my life for so long. No, no, you're done with the excuses. It's clear that your obsession with this fantasy has its hold so tightly on you that all you can do is wait for the next hit of happiness. I've been trying to get you back into the world, but you won't have it because whatever you are now has clearly become so comfortable that you don't even want to try. Not even a little. You know, just because it didn't work out for you doesn't mean the rest of us can't be happy. You're an asshole. Jason, my actual friend, who I haven't seen in a year, I would carry him anywhere. I won't carry you. All this time, I hoped he would come back. Now I'm sure he never will. Chris, all I wanted, all I wanted was to feel better. You and I are done. With that, Chris gets up and leaves. Jason looks despondent and hurt as he stares out of the window. Cut to interior Jason's home night. Jason sits on his futon drinking rum. He looks awful. As the timer for the next episode expires and reads as available, he presses play. Cut to exterior field, night. Jason looks around the field as his eyes adjust to the dark. He sees some lights a bit away and starts to walk toward them. Chris was out of line. He'll apologize. I'll apologize. We'll be talking about RoboCop tomorrow. Jason walks up to a small bridge overlooking a stream. There are candles everywhere and paper lanterns in the water. He hears a car door open and close. Pulling out his phone, he presses play on his song when it made sense. The one she had been humming that first night. Then he waits. Nice song. He opens his eyes and turns around coming face to face with Kara. Thanks. I wrote it for someone special. They're worth it. No question. I'm glad you found this place. I appreciated the hints. Clues. Of course, because I'm... You're a reporter. Want to tell me what you're doing out here? Just hanging out. Hoping to score a dance with a beautiful woman. You know any? Jason does a slight bow and extends his hand. Well, how can a girl say no to that? They dance close together as the song plays for a while. Then Jason takes a deep breath as he draws Kiara close to him. He spins her out, and before pulling her back in, he gets down on one knee. You are the only true good thing in my life. All I want to do is spend every second with you, making you endlessly happy and bothering you to no end. <laughs> I can't imagine my life without you. And I don't want to be empty anymore. He pulls out a ring box and opens it. Kira, will you marry me? Jason looks up at her face. It's a mixture of shock, happiness, and a twinge of fear. A wave of nervousness crashes over him as the time since he asked seems to be endless. Just then, she starts to speak. Cut to interior Jason's home night. Jason wakes up on the futon. What? No, no. What did, what did she say? What did she say? Nervously, he fumbles with the remote to pull up the show page and the timer for the next episode. Only this time, it's back on the home screen of the streaming service. He scrolls around and can't seem to find the show's thumbnail. Nothing. He opens up the search function and searches the show's title. No results. What? He pulls out his phone and opens the mobile app going through the same steps. Nothing. He is frantic and scrambles to open a laptop. He searches Google for the show's name. No results. No, 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 no. It, this is impossible. I was here every night. I didn't miss one. I'm here. He grabs his phone again, searching IMDb, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. He finds nothing. Jason angrily throws his phone at the wall. No, I need her. He rushes over to the TV again and hits search over and over and over again on the remote. Still nothing. It's gone. It starts to hit Jason and he bursts into tears and an incredible fit of anger. We hear no sound as he kicks over a chair. He throws all the garbage in the kitchen on the floor. He opens cabinet doors just to slam them as he screams. He rampages through his townhome, trashing the trash. 
Completely exhausted, he throws himself onto his futon, which promptly falls off the stack of magazines and sends him tumbling to the floor. As Jason lays among the pile of bridal magazines and spilled rum, he closes his eyes. Fade out. Interior, Jason's home. Whoop. Early morning. Jason wakes up with an inhale and looks around. It's real. His townhome is trashed. He doesn't bother picking anything up. He gets to his feet and heads upstairs. As he is about to enter his bedroom, he notices the gleam of something on his spare room. It's his old guitar. He makes his way over to it and runs a hand on it, disturbing a thick layer of dust. He sits on the ground with his back against the wall and starts to hum. Tears fill his eyes again as he hums when it made sense, his song. He tries plucking along to his humming, but there are only five strings and it's clearly had no idea how to play. But he continues humming and plucking as the morning light streams in from the window. Fade out. Interior Jason's home, early morning. A title card reads, six months later. We reveal a clean shaven Jason. His hair is nicely done and he's wearing a crisp shirt and tie, a Windsor knot and everything. We follow Jason downstairs. In his living room sits a nice gray couch and matching love seat. A small kitchen table is accompanied by four matching chairs and the kitchen looks tidy with only a few dishes in the sink. Jason grabs a bottle of water before opening the garage door revealing a new looking blue SUV before heading out. Cut to interior coffee shop day. Jason is sitting in his normal booth sipping from a mug when we pan around and see he's sitting across from Chris. I don't know, I feel like they need a point guard more. They need a lot of things. They'll be great again one day. Keep dreaming. Yeah. There's a bit of an awkward pause. So we've been doing this again for a few weeks now, and it occurred to me that I never said thank you, you know, for being a good friend. We agreed we were past this. You don't have to. You were right, man, about everything, and I'm sorry. I'm never gonna forgive myself for missing that night, but but I promise it'll I'll never abandon I'll never abandon you again. This gives a reassuring nod. Almost time. For what? Never mind. Here we go. Just then a figure walks up to the table and starts speaking in a very loud and robotic voice. Christopher, will you be Jason's best friend again? Chris looks up at the figure, which is a person dressed in a very bad Robocop Halloween costume. What the hell is this? It's Robocop. I know that it's Robocop. <laughs> well, it just seems like you were confused. What is happening? Christopher, will you be Jason's best friend again? <laughs> this is insane. Well, yeah. Chris can't help but start to laugh. Oh, come on, it's been months of me asking for, it's been months of me apologizing and, and weeks of sitting here silently, man. Chris looks at Jason and smirks. Fine. Hey, we did it, RoboCop. <laughs> we protected our friendship and served coffee or something. What are you saying? I, I don't know, man, it's not a perfect metaphor. I don't think you know what a metaphor is. Robocop sucks. He, he conned you into this? It was a nice thought. You did great, huh? I know. That voice, though? What was wrong with the voice? Well, he's still half man. He's a robot. And a cop. I gotta go. Are you guys gonna be there tonight? I don't know. We may have some episodes of The Office to watch. Ouch. I deserve that. But if you change your mind, I'm going on at nine. Are you going to ask her to come? I don't know. You don't think it's too soon? Just go for it. You said you like her. Yeah, we'll see. Jason exits. Cut to an office building day. Jason is sitting at a desk in a modern office. He looks over to the coffee machine where Heather, a blonde woman, is mixing some sugar into coffee. He grabs his mug and heads her way. Hey, Heather. How was your weekend? Not bad. 
Got some cleaning done. How about you? I wish I cleaned. Yeah. Well, this is awkward. Well, I'm gonna head back. Oh, hey, Heather. Yeah? Um, I know it's super last minute, um, but I'm, I'm actually playing an open mic night tonight at uh, Gray's Pub. If you're looking for something to do, you, you should stop by. I didn't know you were a musician. We're going to use that term loosely when applied to me, but um, I'm trying. Well, I love that place, so maybe I will. Awesome. I hope you do. Jason walks back to his desk and immediately pulls out his phone and texts Chris. Crushed it. Cut to interior Jason's home evening. Jason is in his spare bedroom and writing out his set list. For his last song, he is about to write but hesitates. After a beat, he writes down when it made sense, his song. He puts the set list into his pocket when the phone buzzes. It's a notification from the streaming service. Living the Dream season two is now available. Stunned, Jason almost falls out of his chair. He opens the app on his phone. It's there. It's back. Episode one is available now. He stares at the show page, shaking. After a long pause, Jason puts his phone in his pocket. Interior Gray's Pub, night. Jason is standing by the bar when a hand grabs his shoulder. See how bad you suck. Emily elbows Chris. He's kidding. Good luck. You're going to be great. Don't try to be nice now. Yeah, don't try to be nice now. A bell on the pub door rings as a group enters. It's Heather. She smiles and waves to him. Is that her? Yeah, yeah, shut up. Heather walks up to Jason. Hey, thank you for coming. Came to see how much you suck. Exactly what I said. <laughs> Heather, these are my friends, Chris and his fiance Emily. Nice to meet you. You too. Heather looks back at the other people she came in with. She motions for one to come over. Jason, this is my boyfriend, Matt. Jason looks instantly crushed, but quickly recovers to seem cool and save face. He shakes Matt's hand. Nice to meet you. We're going to get a drink, but hopefully we can all hang out afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. As they walk away, Chris puts his hand on Jason's shoulder. It's going to be fine. Just means it wasn't right. No worries, man. I'm, I'm good. I got to go get ready. I'll see you after. Jason hurriedly walks away in a trance. He couldn't check her Instagram to see that she has a boyfriend? I know. I hope he's all right. And me too. Cut to interior Gray's pub back room, night. Backstage, Jason is quickly losing it. He's pacing around. Stupid. This whole thing is stupid. This whole night. What are you doing? I, I can't do this. You can't go through with this. He pulls out his set list and a pen. He starts to cross off the last song. His song gets halfway through when his phone buzzes. It's another notification for Living the Dream season two. He holds his phone in his hand close to his head. He stares at the play episode button. He can barely breathe. Shaking, he starts to hum his song. As he hums, he takes a deep breath and looks at the phone. No. All of the images of his relationship with Kira flash in his mind. He's fighting back tears. Goodbye. With that, he deletes the app as a pub employee comes into the room. Hey, you're on. Okay, thank you. Jason grabs his guitar and catches his reflection in the mirror. He pauses for a moment. Then in a very robotic sounding voice, he quotes Robocop to himself. Your move, creep. Cut to interior Gray's pub stage night. Um, thank you all for coming out tonight. Hopefully it doesn't ruin your evening. With a laugh, Jason starts to play. He's amazing. Chris and Emily are totally shocked. As Jason continues to play and sing, the look of shock disappear into ones of enjoyment. Montage. Jason plays and laughs with the crowd between songs. He looks genuinely happy. End montage. Jason looks at his set list, noticing he's on the last song, the song he started to cross out. He pauses, then takes a deep breath. Okay, um, this is the last song for me tonight. Don't groan, this is an original. It's called When It Made Sense. Jason starts to play his song to a room full of people. 
but for himself. Each note brings him joy as he plays his heart out. Chris looks on with pride. His friend made it back. As Jason continues to play, suddenly the bell in the door of the pub rings as a crowd enters. Distracted by the sound, Jason looks toward the door to the people entering. He spots the face he'd recognize anywhere. It's Kira. As he continues to play, he looks at her and she looks back at him. He can't help but break into a smile. She smiles back and for the first time, she hears his song, the one that he wrote for her. Fade out, the end. Very nice. It doesn't work very well when like three quarters of us are on mute. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the visual. It's the We can all uh, sign language it too, you know? <laughs> very nice. Good, uh, Actually, good job, I want to know who the uh, who that handsome jerk was that left the waiter off the cash sheet. Yeah, yeah, that, that jerk. I, who who put that together handsome, that cash handsome sheet? jerk? <laughs> the same one who left his uh, mic on mute. I guess. Yep. <laughs> so um, before we uh, go on, uh, give me a mic check there, Jeff Moon. <laughs> Can you hear me? Am I still breaking up? <laughs> yeah. Does everyone oh, agree? Yeah. Sound? He should have played Robocop. That was defense. <laughs> <laughs> Your so, move, uh, creep. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it kind of worked. It kind of worked. It, it kind of worked. Uh, I, I, this, if you can't, uh, did you try unplugging, replugging in? I did. Yeah. I Sometimes that happens. Uh, if you've got a different mic, you can try. Um, otherwise, let's. Um, you can fiddle with that, and we'll move on to uh, Joanne, who can uh, say hello to uh, Nick and Brian. Let's switch over. To hey, them. Nick. Hey, Brian. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. So. Uh, Brian, why don't you start? Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and um, how long you've been writing screenplays? Uh, yeah, so Nick and I have been uh, writing together for just about uh, a year and a half now. Um, we've always made movies since we were kids, but uh, we started actually trying to write together and make things uh, for about a year and a half now. Nick, you want to add anything to that? Uh, that pretty much sums it up. I think he and I have always been lovers of film and, you know, um, we used to always talk about movies together. And I think about a year and a half, like you said, we decided to, you know, try something together and it, it just worked. Cool. So how, what does your collaborating look like? How do you guys write together? Uh, we actually try to be um, pretty organized because, um, you know, from the, from the first one we actually wrote together, we would get together every week. Um, we'd have calls, we'd schedule. It was, it was pretty systematic. Um, and we'd kind of have homework and, and kind of a playbook for how we're going to write, you know, the entire thing and how we're going to go about, you know, actually getting together. And I think that's definitely um, held us together. That was kind of the glue that kept everything kind of um, there. So um, definitely having a plan in mind and then, you know, keeping on with executing. Yeah, there's a lot of back and forth. Honestly, it's a lot of just phone calls and conversations of, hey, does this work? Or, hey, what about this? Um, this is actually a much longer script. I apologize for the length uh, for a short screenplay, but uh, I also did want to give a quick shout out to the cast. You guys were phenomenal. So thank you for that. Um, but yeah, uh, we just kind of throw things out at each other and um, it's just a good back and forth that we have and we kind of developed our own language of how we can communicate with with stories so it, it works out well so how did you guys get the inspiration for this so um actually brian kind of came to me with this he you know had first um been listening to uh this song by james bay i'm not sure if anyone knows it but it's called peer pressure um so he had been listening to that uh, for a while and and just kind of kept it on replay and then he he made this skeleton of the of the uh, you know this work and then on top of that um, from the last screenplay that we wrote it was having to do with technology and um, you know kind of its hold on us as a society and I think we kind of took that into it as well um, and I guess I, I guess you could say that's how it kind of came about. Yeah, I think we wanted to keep a technology base more of like we wanted to kind of make a small anthology film and have technology be the key. Uh, and I remember Nick mentioning something about binging shows and could that be something. And one night while uh, my wife and I were just 
watching The Office after a couple episodes, that screen comes up that says, are you still watching? And I would, that was just kind of the inspiration. And then I just called Nick right away and I'm like, hey, there, there's something here. I don't know what it is yet. And then it wasn't until I listened to that James Bay song over and over again. And I'm like, okay, I got, I, I, I see where we can go with this. And then it just kind of spiraled from there. How many scripts have you guys written together? We've written two together. And we are working on uh, two more right now. Cool. So I got some questions from Mike because, you know. So he wants to know, do either of you play the guitar? Nick is a very, very talented musician. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> and he was say, asking, too, if there was any unfulfilled dreams of performing. Um. Uh, well, Nick performs all the time and he's also, I'm going to plug for him. He's also doing right now a charity drive for uh, the strong hospital. Um, and they're putting on like a concert on YouTube live. So go check that out also. Fantastic. Maybe we can get the link and put it up on our site. Yeah, that sounds good. Awesome. <laughs> so one of the other ones from Mike is uh, he said the, the danger with, with pop culture jokes is that they can be seen tacked on, you know, insert your reference here. But uh, the Robocop reference actually built character and was a good payoff. At what point did you bring that in? And was there ever another movie that you had a reference? So the, the actual answer and not the pretentious answer is Robocop just sounds funny. I think uh, <laughs> like it just, I, something like in that conversation when someone isn't listening and then to just riff off yeah, something crazy, just, just riff. that's something that I do personally to people all the time. Um, so yeah, Robocop um, so just yeah, sounded Robocop funny, sounded but funny. yeah, there was, yeah. I think, um, an interesting analogy there uh, for Robocop of just kind of having, again, working in the technology and kind of having someone lose his humanity a little bit piece by piece to technology, but finds his way back at the end. If anyone's not familiar with the 80s movie RoboCop, there's a little bit of an analogous correlation there. Cool. So another one from Mike is, the script had a couple of ticking clocks. Chris's yeah. proposal to his girlfriend and Jason's involvement and the countdown of episodes, which eventually run out. Is that something that you guys, you know, thought about and that you planned for? Yeah, absolutely. We definitely wanted to put pressure on uh, Jason because obviously when we meet him, he's just in this kind of state of disrepair and we wanted to push him all the way to the brink to really um, get him to his lowest low and we just felt the best way to do that was to put a ticking clock on him and also give him uh, like you said a secondary one with Chris's proposal for to give him an opportunity to really mess something up um, in the in the actual world so yeah, that was an early on in the process cool would uh the um what's some of the most more challenging aspects of script writing for you guys Making it short. <laughs> <laughs> there was, a, yeah, there was an entire subplot about Jason's actual work and we had a, a really cool character in his boss that we liked and it added about 10 pages, um, but we were already at time, so we had to cut it. So we figured that there's probably a feature in here somewhere, um, but yeah, it was really just the kill your darlings thing of we had to cut what uh, just wasn't needed in, in the time frame we had. So that's definitely been the hardest thing is scaling it back. All right. I'm gonna open it up to the other, any of the uh, cast members here or the Rafa's team. You guys got any questions? Well, actually one thing that I was thinking of uh, when I first read the script and even while we were reading it here tonight, there's this um, thing, I didn't create it myself, but generally when somebody you know is aspiring to something, is like, I wanna do this, I wanna be great at this, blah, blah, blah. I always ask them, where do you wanna be 10 years from now? And they list all the things that they want. And the next thing I say is, well, what did you do today? And if what they did today was smoking pot, playing video games, stuff like that, doesn't correlate to where they want to be, it's like, well, that's your problem there. And that's what I really saw in this script. I just didn't know if that was something that was going on in your heads, where what you do today is where you're going to get yourself, you know, five, 10 years down the line. Because that's really what it seemed to me reading this, that it seemed to be, you know, 
you know, in order to achieve your dreams, you actually have to start working at them. Yeah, I'll let, I'll let Nick uh, give the, the one sentence uh, kind of slogan that we were working with that we lifted from local uh, yoga studios. <laughs> Um, I, it's actually so fitting and it's really interesting that you brought that up because um, he, he and I, you know, had uh, kind of been throwing this around too. Um, but definitely it's kind of a don't wish for it, work for it. And I think the beauty of this story is that you have this guy who, you know, has lost himself and it doesn't end with, I mean, it, like it seems like it's not, like he's not really doing anything for a girl in particular. He's just finding himself and figuring out how to get over you know, the loss that he's had and, and, and kind of, you know, the life that he's kind of lost. And um, now he's kind of coming back to himself and really kind of working on himself. And then it's just the cherry on top that none other than Kira walks in the room who he initially wrote the song for. You know what I mean? Yeah. All right, that's that's uh, terrific. I, I I'm I'm cutting in here just so that we don't um, uh, go too long. But I think uh, uh, congratulations are both in order for uh, Brian and Nick. Uh, very good. Uh, I enjoyed the script quite a bit. Um, I'm looking Thank at you, our Alex. YouTube comments. Uh, it seems that uh, Alex's fan club is in the YouTube uh, comments. <laughs> Absolutely nice. tonight. Um, and uh, one from Ron Dufort says, nice, great tone, recognizable, relatable character voices, and nice emotional ups and downs, well-performed as well, which is nice. Uh, very good. Very good, guys. Uh, obviously, uh, you can stick around if you like. Um, I did mute uh, a few people who, when the mic was, the camera was jumping back and forth between people. So. Uh, if you're an actor and you're going to be performing uh, soon, keep an eye on your mic. Let's do one more test of Jeff. Jeff, let's hear your new microphone. Okay. <laughs> uh, you need to turn the volume up. Okay, hold on. Yeah. He was almost there. All right. Jeff, we might have to have you switch back to the to the other mic. It was uh, we did a, we did do a uh, a dry run a couple of days ago. We didn't have this problem, but uh, such is the nature of the internet. Well, yeah, I mean, problems aren't going to arise during the dress rehearsal. No, so it's always no. during the regular show. <laughs> All right. Uh, how how soon is w what part is Jeff playing in the next one? Uh, he's uh, he's the doctor. Okay, so yeah, he's, got he's one of the doctors. He's uh, I think past a halfway point. Say again, Jeff. Okay, I can hear you again. We'll just have to make two with a RoboCop microphone and I think that'll be okay. All right. Um, I think we're ready to move on with uh, Superbug by Gio Forlenza. And I will uh, hand it off to Sean who will tell us who is playing whom. Okay, for Superbug, as Gregory, we have K. Cody Hunt. As the father, we have Ken Rhodes. As a mother, we have Bridget Yaxley. As Greta, we have Tyler Azer. As Dr. Kafka, we have Catherine Fudge. As Estella, as Estella, we have Melody Rorig. As Professor Klinghoffer, we have Jeff Moon. And as Roach Boy, we have Sean Esler. <laughs> of course. I All guess. right. <laughs> so without further ado, here's Superbug. <clears throat> Take it away, Wayne. Interior, Samson Home Night. Open floor plan, tastefully decorated, impeccably clean. Father, mother, and daughter Greta Sampson, 12, are in the kitchen. Greta practices playing a flute. Mother takes dinner out of the oven and places it on the table. Bravo, Greta. Is that Bridget? Is that Bridget? Take it again, Bridget. Sorry, you're muted. Okay. Absolutely magnificent. Soon you'll be playing Carnegie Hall. Gregory, dinner's ready. Gregory Sampson, 17, shuffles in, eyes glued to his phone. Sit. Mother prepared a wonderful meal. Nissoise salad and wild Alaskan salmon. I ate. What? Pizza. Where? My room. Oh, I feel sick. No surprise. 
that pizza was a week old. Pizza tasted okay. I'm coming down with something. I feel funny. Gregory shuffles to the refrigerator. He pulls out milk and guzzled from the carton. Milk dribbling down his chin. You're not funny. You're gross. Gregory, that's revolting. And unsanitary. He's spreading germs. Chillax. I'm just finishing what's left. He gulps down the last of the milk, tosses the carton at the trash, misses, leaves it on the floor. Greta oinks. Oink, oink, oink. Egg. Germaphobe. He grabs her flute and blows a few notes, slobbering all over the mouthpiece. Greta screams. Mom! Gregory! Give Greta her flute. Ew, he drooled on it. Don't touch it. I'll clean it. Mother washes the flute in the sink. Then she sprays disinfectant everywhere, wiping everything down. Have you done your homework? Working on it. What about college applications? Working on it. What about your room? It's like a giant petri dish growing hazardous waste. And things. I'm going to get the exterminator to fumigate it. Get back here, sport. We're talking to you. Let him go. He's ruining our meal. Gregory slams his bedroom door closed. What does he do in that room? Xbox. Search the internet for photos of scantily clad models. Then he sleeps all day. His blinds are always closed. He's become a nocturnal night crawler. You know, tomorrow morning things are going to change. My father used to get me up at the crack of dawn by clanging a pot and pan together over my head. Then he yanked the covers off me. And if I still didn't get up, a bucket of ice water was next. Sounds like a plan. Let's do it. We're gross. Little boys are cute. Teenage boys, ugh, metamorphosize into vile creatures. What does metamorphosize mean? You know how an icky caterpillar emerges from a cocoon as a beautiful butterfly? Yes. With a boy, it's the opposite. Mother pats her daughter's hand lovingly. I wish we had two girls. Greta is precious, isn't she? Father pats his daughter's other hand. They all smile. Interior Gregory's bedroom, night. The room is barely enough space to move around because every service is covered with junk food wrappers, cans, bottles, and pizza boxes. Dirty clothes litter the floor. And there's a stench that even Gregory wrinkles his nose at. Gregory sits at his desk wearing a headset, swiveled in a bucket chair, fingering a joystick. The explosive violence on his computer monitor is the only light in the dark room. Over his desk is a shrine of pictures taped to the wall. The photos are of Melania Naus back when she was a model, scantily clad or nude, and printed off the internet. Gregory ends his video game at a fiery explosion and a vulgar belch. He climbs onto be into bed and slides a magazine out of his night table drawer. Close on, GQ magazine, January 2000. Melania is on the cover, naked, sprawled on fur. The headline reads, sex at 30,000 feet. Melania Naus earns her air miles. Gregory kisses Melania's picture. Good evening, Melania. Sorry for keeping you waiting. Gregory disappears under his bed covers with Melania. Exterior, Samson home, day, morning sun. Birds chirp the start of a beautiful day. Gregory, wake up. You're going to be late for school. Interior, Gregory's bedroom, day. Mother swings open the door and navigates her way into the toxic disaster of a room. She's wearing latex gloves and a surgical face mask as he yanks up the blinds and lets sunlight stream in. Father enters next, clanging a pot and a pan. Gregory, let's go. Up and out. Greta enters last, also wearing a face mask and pointing a super soaker water cannon filled with ice water. He's going to be late for school. Not on my watch. Father leans in and clangs the pot over the bed where Gregory is hiding beneath the covers. Mother leans in with her latex glove and yanks the covers off the bed. Gregory squirms on his back, blinded by the sunlight. Mother, father, and little Greta scream at what they see. <clears throat> Somehow, 
Overnight, Gregory has turned into a large insect. He's still got his pimple-faced teenage boy head, but from the neck down, his body is a cockroach. Greta blasts Gregory's face with her super soaker before fleeing from the bedroom with mother and father, all screaming. When Gregory reaches to wipe the water off his face, he sees a bug's foreleg scratching at his cheek. He looks down and sees the <clears throat> the underside of a cockroach body with spindly legs and a segmented abdomen. Gregory releases a long, terrified scream. Interior Samson home day. Father, mother, and Greta are huddled together in the kitchen. Was that Gregory? I think so. Mom, Dad, help! Interior Gregory's bedroom day. Gregory rocks back and forth trying to roll off his hard-shelled back. His forelegs, mid-legs, and hind legs flail helplessly in the air. His mesothorax and segmented abdomen contract and twist, but Gregory can't flip himself over. Father, mother, and Greta creep cautiously into the room. Gregory? I should have fumigated his room. Help, roll me off my back. Father steps forward and inches toward the bed. He picks up a hockey stick and pokes at Gregory's brown exoskeleton. Uh, roll to one side. <clears throat> Gregory leans to his right. Father slides the hockey stick underneath Gregory's metathorax, the posterior segment of an insect, and with a loud grunt of strength, leverages Gregory uh, off his back. When Gregory flips over, he scurries around in a panic. Mother and Greta dive out of his way, screaming. Father <laughs> retreats into a bathroom and vomits in the sink. Interior Samson home day. Gregory scurries around the house in a frantic frenzy until he's exhausted. Greta flees into her room and slams the door. Do something! Like what? Mother grabs a broom and chases Gregory back into his room. Father slams the door closed. They both lean against the wall on either side of the bedroom door, bathed in sweat, hearts beating out of their chests. What now? I'll call a doctor. Interior, Gregory's bedroom day. The door creaks open. Father, mother, and Dr. Kafka peek in. Gregory, Dr. Kafka is here. They open the door fully and enter. Mother carries the broom wearing her sterile face mask. Father holds the hockey stick. Dr. Kafka looks around the room with disgust. Sorry about the room, teenage boy. A common dilemma, where is he? Father pokes the hockey stick under the bed. Get out from under there. Let the doctor examine you. Go away. Gregory. I'm here to help. Okay, but close the blinds. The light hurts my eyes. Mother raises her latex gloved hands and pulls the blinds closed. The room darkens. Greta peers in from the hallway. Greta, go to your room. I want to wash. Then come in and close the door behind you. We don't want him running around the house again. Greta enters and closes the door. Gregory creeps out from under his bed. Dr. Kafka gasps in horror. Hi, Dr. Kafka. I think I caught some kind of a bug. Wait in our statement, Gregory. The, the doctor feels Gregory's human forehead, looks in his ears and down his throat, then shows a thermometer in his mouth. He pulls a stethoscope from his bag, but has trouble finding a place to put it on the roach body. He listens to the prothorax, mesothorax, and then the first abdominal segment. Breathe deeply. Hmm. Hmm. What hmm. is it? No idea. Might be a superbug. A uh, superbug? Bugs have grown smarter and more resilient. This one's a real whopper. How did he get it? There are two cardinal sins from which all others spring. Impatience and laziness. Have you been a lazy boy, Gregory? Gregory shrugs meekly. The doctor puts his stethoscope away. What's your prognosis, doctor? There's an infinite amount of hope in the universe, but not for us. Mother and father exchange puzzled glances. Excuse me? Everything that you love you will eventually lose. But in the end, love will return in a different form. Doctor, please. Stop talking in riddles. Riddles? I share pearls of wisdom. A mind is like a parachute. It doesn't work unless it's open. The 
The doctor buttons her coat and steps toward the door. But what should we do? Give him these pills, the strongest antibiotic I know. And if they don't work, call an entomologist. A scientist who studies insects. He pats Greta, she pats Greta on the head as she exits the bedroom. Mother and father chase after her. Doctor, wait, isn't there anything else we can do? Well, there is one other option. Call an exterminator. The doctor makes a hasty exit. Interior Gregory's bedroom day. Mother and father entered the room with a pitcher of water and a, and a and refill a bowl on the floor. Here's more water. Did you take your pill? I can't get the bottle open. He's useless, isn't he? Well, to be fair, he doesn't have fingers. I looked online and learned the tip of his foreleg is called a tarsus, hardly designed for opening pill bottles. You're right. I'm sorry, Gregory. Even I have trouble with safety caps. Let me help you. She twists open the bottle and retrieves a pill. Open wide. Gregory opens his mouth and mother tosses a pill in. Gregory swallows, then bends over the bowl and drinks like a dog. Yuck. Oh, listen to him slurp. Well, it doesn't sound much different than before. He was a slurper, wasn't he? Gregory, Stella is coming to clean your room. We're going to need you to hide while she's here. No. Don't be difficult, Gregory. Cleaning your room might help. I like my room the way it is. That's the cockroach in you talking, Gregory. We want to make the bug inside you as uncomfortable as possible. Maybe it will take a hint and leave. Okay. How did this happen to us? I miss my sweet little Greggy. If only, if only we could turn back time. She musters up enough courage to lean in close, past the spindly roach legs, and kisses her son's forehead. Gregory reacts like Dracula getting impaled by a wooden stake. Look at you now. This breaks my heart. Go hide in the bathroom before Estella sees you and take a long, hot shower while you're in there, please. Mom. Do it! Gregory crawls into the bathroom. Interior, Gregory's bedroom day. Housekeeper, Estella, is up to her elbows cleaning the room. She tosses garbage into bags marked with hazardous mornings. Interior bathroom day. Gregory is in the bathtub trying to turn on the faucets with his four legs tarsus. A difficult, if not impossible, task. Mom, Dad, I need your help. The door opens and Estella peers in. Gregory? Hi, Estella. Gregory waves <gasps> hello with a cockroach's foreleg. Estella screams and runs out the door. Exterior, Samson home, day. Estella flees out of the house. Mother chases her. Estella, wait. You're not done cleaning. Estella drives, dives in her car and peels away. <clears throat> Interior, Samson home, day. Mother returns, exasperated, tossing her hands in the air at father. There goes another housekeeper. Interior, Gregory's room, day. Mother enters the bedroom and inspects the cleaning job. Father steps up behind her. Looks better. She didn't bust. His shrine to Melania is still on the wall. Father leans in and examines a picture of Melania sprawled nude on a fur. Mother yanks it off the wall and tears it up. Disgusting. I don't know what he sees in her. She plucks the rest of the photos off the wall and throws them in the trash. Mom? Dad? Interior bathroom day. Mother and father find Gregory in the bathtub. I thought I told you to hide. I did. Estella walked in on me. Did you lock the door? I can't with these appendages. Uh, it's always something with you. I was trying to take a shower, but I can't turn the knobs. Mother turns the knobs and water blasts down on Gregory. Ah, too hot. She twists another knob. Too cold. Let me do that. You go get dinner ready, Mother. Mother exits. Father adjusts the knobs. How does that feel? Better. Thanks. 
Gregory, you can't say that you didn't have this coming. I mean, you've been living like a filthy animal and eating nothing but garbage. Yeah, I guess. You know what they say, you are what you eat. Never ate a bug. Yet somehow you became one. <sighs> we love you, Gregory. You'll always be our boy, but once you started closing your bedroom door, you locked us out of your life. Can you blame your mother for being angry and frustrated now? Little Greta walks in and sees Gregory in the shower. Gregory uses his mid lace to cover his protruding trochanter. Ew. Get out! I'm taking a shower! Gross. Greta, get out. It's my bathroom, too. Close the door. Greta slams the door. Father turns the water off and hands Gregory a fresh towel. His forelegs fumble with the towel. Gregory starts to cry. I can't. Don't cry, sport. I'll help dry you off. Climb out. Gregory climbs out of the tub and lays on the bath mat. Father uses a big fluffy towel to dry his hair, face, prothorax, mesothorax, metathorax, and segmented abdomen. Look at that. You got a six pack. I do. Actually, it's more like a 12 pack and it's tight. Gregory flexes his thorax and father gives him a playful volley of punches in the gut. I've been Googling up things and you know what I learned? A roach can move about 50 body lengths in a second. A human moving that quickly would be running about 200 miles an hour. Really? Yes, but uh, don't run in the house. You know your mother. And did you know you have wings? I do? Yes, indeed, yo. Vestigial wings. What are those? Well, you can't fly like a bird, but if you practice, you should be able to get some air. Really? Wouldn't that be special? He ruffles his son's hair affectionately. See, Gregory, every cloud has a silver lining. How many kids do you know who have wings? Gregory smiles. Interior Gregory's room, night. Gregory pokes at his trash bin with his foreleg and finds his pictures of Melania crinkled, crinkled and torn. Mom. Mom enters the room carrying a dinner tray. What's wrong now? Did you trash my Melania pictures? Yes, because that's what she is. Trash. I hate you. Really? Here I am preparing yet another healthy meal for you, and that's what I get in return. She tosses the dinner tray on his desk. I don't know what your sick fascination is with Melania, but as long as you live under my roof, she's not going to be your first lady. It's over. I literally hate you. Get out. Not before you take your pill. No. You want to remain a cockroach for the rest of your life? Reluctantly, Gregory opens his mouth. Mother tosses the pill down his throat. Gregory swallows, then slurps water from his bowl until he gets the bitter taste out of his mouth. Don't you take me for granted again. My patience is wearing thin. Mother storms out the door, slamming it behind her. Gregory crawls to his desk and finds his phone. He claws at the screen with his foreleg, but the tip of his tarsus is not touchscreen sensitive. He knocks his phone aside. He sits in his swivel chair the best his exoskeleton is able to do, and tries to type on his keyboard, work his joystick and play a game. Not happening. Frustrated, he spits green slime at his flat screen monitor. He crawls to the window and looks out into the night air, longing to be a normal boy again. Every cloud has a silver lining. How many kids do you know who have wings? Gregory's brow wrinkles with concentration as he tries to send motor neurons from his brain to move his wings. His face scrunches up like he's constipated until finally Gregory flaps his wings. A moment later, his bug body is levitating off the floor. Roaches cannot fly high or far. Gregory manages to leap over the bed and land on the wall where he sticks. Gregory climbs up the wall using the sticky hooks on his, the tips of his tarsus. He smiles, pleased with his new skill. Interior Samson home night. Greta is practicing her flute in the living room. Father, mother are on the sofa enjoying the lovely recital. Stop, it sounds horrible. Keep playing, Greta. Music soothes the savage beast. Gregory angrily pokes, his, pokes out his bedroom door. I heard that. I can hear everything, I can't stand it. He slams his bedroom door. It must be his tympanal organs. What? I Googled it. 
Tiny hairs on a bug's body pick up sound and vibration. It's probably driving him mad. So now Greta can't play her flute? I didn't say that. The pills aren't helping. Nothing is. Time to call the entomologist. Or an exterminator. Greta. She has a point. Why prolong the inevitable? Girls, please. I know this ordeal is fraying your nerves, but Gregory is still human. Only his head is, and that has pimples. Soon he'll be off to college. What if no college accepts him? I mean, how long can we go on like this? One step at a time, okay? I'll call an entomologist. Interior, Gregory's room, day. The door creaks open. Mother, father, lead an entomologist named Professor Klinghoffer into the bedroom. Gregory, come out from under the bed. Professor Klinghoffer is here. Hello, Gregory. Father pokes the hockey stick under the bed. Oh, boy. They look up to see Gregory clinging to the ceiling. Hey, look at you up there. That's my boy. Ach, du Liebe. Professor Klinghoffer is beside himself with excitement. Gregory, when did you learn to walk on the ceiling? Come down and say hello. The professor thinks he can help you. He's from the Kierling Institute. You know, the place on Plum Hill. Gregory drops down into the professor's arms. Ich Spinne. What a magnificent creature. Thank you. Uh, you appear to be a periplaneta americana. Uh, what's that? American cockroach. Uh, largest of its species, far larger than the common German cockroach. Let's see how fast you can run. Sure. Gregory races around the room. Mother dives out of the way. Not in the house! Do gets missed out of the keks. I see he's rattling mother's nerves. You think? Gregory. Would you like to come to the Keeling Institute with me? Not really. <laughs> oh, it's not far from home. Only six miles upwind as the crow flies. You would love my laboratory. We could have so much fun together. Doing what? I have the latest equipment. We could do all kinds of experiments. I'll pack his bag. M Mother, let's not rush into this. What kind of experiments? Well, to start, we want to see what makes you tick inside. What internal organs are in there? What color is your blood? I'm not going to be your lab rat. Rat? Nine. I am an entomologist. My passion is insects. Professor Klinghoffer pets Gregory's wings. Oh, what beautiful wings you have. Please don't pet my boy. Oh. I can't resist such a magnificent specimen. Gregory scurries away and hides under the bed. Professor Klinghoffer is excited by the challenge. Unglaublich! Fantastisch creature! Keep him away from me! Oh, you like hide and seek, Gregory? I play with you. Professor Klinghoffer gets on his knees and starts crawling under the bed. Come out, come out, wherever you are! Excuse me, Professor. Father grants the professor by the collar of his tweed suit and yanks him to his feet. Time to leave. But we're just getting acquainted. Nobody's experimenting on my boy. Interior Samson home night. Father and Greta sit at the dinner table. Father opens the mail as mother cleans up. Thanks for another delicious meal. I'm glad somebody appreciates my cooking. Greta, practice your flute before you do your homework. Greta picks up her flute. It's covered with green slime. She drops it and screams. Oh, I'll never play the flute again. Don't say that, Greta. I'll sterilize it. You can't. He ruined it. Mother washes the flute under the sink and yells furiously. Gregory, we warned you not to touch Greta's flute. Oh, no. Look at this. Gregory's been turned down by another college. That's the last one. I'm to send him to the Keeling Institute. Let Professor Klinghoffer have a try. Oh, surely there's a better option. Like what? We can't have a 
parasite living under our roof forever. He's not a parasite. Cockroaches are scavengers. What's the difference? He's still freeloading. Maybe he'll outgrow his phase and meet a nice girl. The last thing we need is him breeding under our roof. We'll have an infestation. Call the exterminator. Greta. Not getting accepted into college was the last straw. I want him out. Well, I'm not comfortable calling the exterminator. Well, I'm not comfortable with his newfound ability to walk on walls and ceilings. It's time for him to move out. Yeah. Let's take a family vote. Hooray! Whoever wants Gregory to move out of our house, give the thumbs down sign. If you want him to stay, give a thumbs up. I'll go first. Mother turns her thumb down decisively. Father? Father raises a hopeful thumbs up. Looks like a tie. Greta, you have the final vote. Should Gregory stay or go? Greta holds her small hand out. It wavers before her thumb turns down. Mother smiles proudly. That's my girl. As Greta smiles, something wet drips on her face. Everyone looks up to see that Gregory is above them, clinging to the ceiling. He's been listening the whole time and tears are dripping down his cheeks. Ew, he drips on me. Gregory, get down. I will not have you walking on my ceiling. Gregory scampers away and disappears into his room. You hurt his feelings. He shouldn't have been hanging up there. He was dropping like a spy. Yeah. Interior, Gregory's bedroom night. Gregory looks at the place on his wall where his Melania shrine once was in size. He crawls to the window and tries to open it to escape, but it's beyond the dexterity of his tarsus. As Gregory gazes out at a full moon hanging low in the night sky, we hear the song, All By Myself, sung by Eric Carmen. It's a sad but beautiful song. Gregory's eyes moisten. Interior garage night. The Sampson family climb into their car. Come on, Gregory. I, I don't want to go. Please, I promise I'll change. Time to leave the nest, Gregory. Sorry, son. I don't agree with this, but we did take a family vote. Doesn't my vote count? Thumbs up or down? And you have no thumbs. Please, Sport. Don't make this harder than it has to be. Gregory calls into the rear passenger door and tries to climb into the back seat next to his sister. Uh, not on the upholstery, the leather upholstery. Mother leads Gregory to the rear of the car. Father hoists Gregory into the trunk. I want to die. You know what Dr. Kafka said. One of the first signs of the beginning of understanding is the wish to die. She slams the trunk lid closed. Exterior motel night. Father backs his car up into a parking spot in front of the door to a motel room where mother and Greta wait. That's good. Stop. Father shuts off the car and opens the trunk. This way, Gregory. Father leads him into the motel room. Interior motel room night. Gregory crawls around exploring the motel room. It's a disgusting dive. Father tries to make the best of it. Look at this old phone. It's an old rotary dial. Ever seen one of these? The tip of your tarsus can fit in these holes, and you can dial us any time you want. You'll finally have your own bathroom. There's a snack machine, a dumpster out back if you're hungry. I paid for a year in advance. Here are your pills. Take them diligently three times a day, and maybe you'll kill the bug. Well, I guess this is goodbye. Gregory turns to see his mother and Greta are crying. Gregory, I'm so sorry. Mom, don't. I'm going to change. You'll see, I promise. This makes her cry more. Come on, come on now. Dry those eyes. Let's bring it in for a group hug. Gregory extends his roach legs. Greta and mother recoil. Then again, maybe not. Bye, Gregory. Mother leads Greta out of the out to the car. Okay, well, son. Hey, do you want to hear more fascinating facts I learned online? 
Cockroaches can hold their breath for 40 minutes or more and survive underwater. Really? Yes. And you can live for a week if your head's cut off. It's good to know. Cockroaches have been crawling on Earth since before dinosaurs. They were? Absolutely. Cockroaches can even survive a nuclear apocalypse. Really? Yes, indeed. So when we all go to hell in a handbasket, you'll be scurrying all over the rubble with a smile on your face. Silver lining, son. Silver lining. He ruffles Gregory's hair affectionately and pulls a magazine out of his coat. It's GQ's January 2000 edition with Melania on the cover. He hands it to Gregory. Don't tell mother I gave you this. Gee. Thanks, Dad. Dial if you need me, sport. I'm just a phone call away. He turns and exit the motel room. <laughs> Exterior motel night. As Gregory watches his family drive away, we now see the motel's glowing neon sign. It reads Roach Motel. The Eric Carmen ballad, All By Myself, rises up as Gregory stands alone in the parking lot watching his parents drive out of sight. His eyes well up, but before the tears flow, motel room doors creak open. Roach boys with human heads, just like Gregory's, crawl out of their rooms into the dark parking lot. The motel is infested. A friendly roach boy scurries up beside Gregory. Thought they'd never leave. Didn't listen to your mother, huh? How'd you guess? You are not alone. He extends a friendly foreleg and they shake their tarsus. Loud music plays. The party begins. Roll end credits. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I, I was muted, so no one got the chance to hear my uh, laughing, but there was quite... Quite a few lines in there that make me laugh, Gio. Um, let me unmute you there. Um, good job, everyone. This is this is terrific. Um, let's uh, find out a little more about uh, the script from Gio here. And I actually have uh, some pictures to share also, some cockroach pictures. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'll go ahead and take it away, Joanne. Great. Gio, first off, congratulations. And Thank you. Uh, I, I did notice that you did some you did some big changes and and I, I love the changes. They were really good. I think I okay. like the mother a lot more. I like the mother a lot more. So um, tell us a little, little bit about yourself and how long you've been writing screenplays. Uh, I was a lit major and I wrote when I was younger. And then I started again about three years ago. And I wrote a bunch of features and I got feedback that was pretty good. They, they liked the quality of my writing, but inevitably they'd say something like, oh, well, it's a, just another ransom plot. We've seen that before. That's another revenge plot. We've seen that before. So I decided to try to write something really original and as far-fetched and out there as I could, maybe to get some you know, bigger reaction from people. And I started writing a bunch of shorts uh, for a series I called The Karmic Loop, um, which were kind of cautionary tales, uh, what goes around comes around. And that's where Superbug came out of. So uh, since you're talking about The Karmic Loop, tell us uh, some more about the, the, some of the other stories that, you've, uh, that you have for that. Uh, one was called Tourist Trap, and that uh, opens with two hunters that have an elk they just shot in the back of their pickup, and they stop at a diner in the middle of nowhere to have a bite to eat, and the roof lifts off the diner, a giant plucks them out of the diner's booth seats and eats them, uh, so it starts with that, so it's a dark comedy, um, and then people, tourists, uh, you know, one after another come to the diner and the giant eats them until finally at the end, one person manages to kill the giant. So um, what was your inspiration for uh, Superbug? Like, do you have uh, teenage sons? Uh, no, I don't, but I was once a teenage boy, so I <laughs> how's it, how it goes. Um, I came up with the idea of, a, a, you know, a boy who's uh, guilty in, in the karmic loop, all the characters are anti-heroes and they're guilty of one of the seven deadly sins. So I wanted to deal with sloth. I came up with a teenage boy who turns into a cockroach. Um, and I realized that it was kind of Franz Kafka's emphasis, which I read way back in college. So rather than ignore the novel, I decided to go with it and do an homage to, to 
Franz Kafka's The Metamorphosis. Um, and I worked in a lot of, uh, you know, his plot themes and elements in it, including the names and Franz Kafka's novel. It was Gregor Samsa and the character is Gregory Samson. And the girl's Greta is, is his sister. And um, basically updated it to a modern nuclear family. What other what other styles of or genres of screenplays do you prefer to write? Well, I like comedy, um, but I've written tried my hand at you know just about every genre. The comedy is kind of fun and it makes the uh, work easier if you're in the room having fun and laughing. One of the this is one of Mike's questions and going off your uh, your comedy he said how did you approach the tone of the piece? Uh, it's satirical, but also touching when it comes to the father's relationship with the son. Um, the tone is dark comedy, very dry, uh, probably surrealist, absurdist comedy. Um, and that comedy comes from ridiculous situations, uh, absurd moments and uh, surprises. Um, so that's that's how I went with the tone of the comedy. Some people totally get it. Other people didn't realize it was a comedy. I've had a reader that was surprised the end was funny, and and I guess she didn't realize it was comedy in the whole script. So, <laughs> okay, can you tell us a little bit more about the graphic novel that you're going to be doing based on Superbug? Thanks. My brother and I wanted to do something together for a couple of years, and he's an architect and a good artist. So he's been doing uh, the graphics in Daz Studio, 3D modeling, and uh, we hope to make this uh, our first graphic model. Oops. And uh, Mike is sharing some of the screens now so that we can oh, yeah. that. There's Gregory in his uh, room after he turned into a cockroach. <laughs> yeah, well, we've all been there before. There's an actual picture of Melania in the background. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to have a rights issue with that. That's Gregory in his bedroom. That's Gregory calling on the ceiling. Uh, we decided to go with a more comic version of a cockroach. So it's uh, a little more humorous and frightening. There's Dr. Kafka. My brother actually modeled him after pictures of Franz Kafka. That's your kitchen with Greg slugging the milk down. There's Greta and her flute. There's Dr. Uh, Professor Klinghoffer. Oh, nice. <laughs> Another Greta. I think that's I think that's the last one I have here. Yeah, awesome. yeah. That's cool. Uh, definitely has some potential there. You get you get the tone right from the the human head on the cockroach. It's good. Thank you. How do you guys like it? I'd like to hear some feedback. <laughs> I thought it was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. I was extremely fascinated with it. Um, I just, I loved all the different family dynamics and just how many layers to it there were that you put in there. And um, I, if I could like work a question in, I, I haven't read the metamorphosis since like high school, but I was a little curious about, you know, once you found that parallel to the, the boy turning into a bug, and stumbled on that. Were there any sort of, I guess, links that you tried to make in that homage specifically? I think about the fact that like in the book, Gregor was a provider, but Gregory's like the opposite. And so I'm wondering if that was conscious or if there were any other little parallels that you made in there, just that were in your creative process or how you how you dealt with making it an homage, but not a copy or, or that interaction. Yeah, well, first thing I did was I didn't go back and read the book because I didn't wanna <laughs> be too close. And you hear some actors, you know, recreating roles and all like, I didn't want to go see that book. So I just wanted to base it on my memory. Um, and I, what I remembered was it was kind of dark and bleak and he dies at the end, a miserable existence. He starves to death and it's horrible. So I wanted to make it lighter and funnier. And I just wanted to work in more of the teenage boy angst. We but have actually- Easter eggs are in there if I can throw some into. Uh, Kierling, Kierling is where Kafka actually died. He went into a sanatorium 
and he actually died of tuberculosis of the larynx, so he starved to death, which is pretty horrible. Um, and the Kierling, so I put the Kierling Institute in there, and that's six miles upwind, and it's on Plum Hill, which Plum Island is where they did the uh, bio weapon research off Long Island and supposedly spread Lyme disease. So, um, and we're working on more installments of, of the graphic novels too, which we'll find out how Gregory and the Roach Boys got what they got, where they go from here. Great, anybody else? I loved playing mom. <laughs> that was so much job. fun. Thank you so much. Thank, you did a thank terrific you. job. I was channeling my own mother. <laughs> All the angst and, you know, irritation in her. <laughs> that it was, was a lot of fun. It. it was really fun hearing you guys read the lines. Thank you. Very good. Uh, there is one uh, comment from Ron Dufort in uh, YouTube. He said he said, love dad's optimism, uh, kept the tone curious instead of frightening. Um, what would you think of as a representative song that would fit the style you're picturing? Well, you kind of have a song in the in the script, um, but is there any other music that would 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 uh, I guess fit um, that? I, had, I hadn't thought about that other than the uh, all by myself. Mm -hmm. you know, the theme is really about isolation and loneliness. Mm -hmm. uh, I like that Ron picked up also the 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 way the uh, father's relationship is with you know everyone is. Mm -hmm. The characters are all very sort of far, farcical, uh, the mother and the, and the sister, but the father actually is trying. He's trying to like keep that relationship with the, you know, it's very touching. I, I like that. Thank you. I, I'm most proud probably of the father-son relationship. Yeah. And thanks for recognizing the, the final draft of the mother because that was tough for me. Mm -hmm. I made her softer and warmer and a little, little more nice. <laughs> Probably can still work on that. Anything else, Joanne? Um, let's see. Um, how about for any newer or aspiring writers? Do you have any words of wisdom out there? Um, I would say uh, write as much as you can. Uh, read all the books. I read all the top screenwriting books. Um, learn all format and uh what have others have done before you try to break new ground and then then you can play around with breaking new ground and there is one quote i can't remember where i got it from but i had this on my wall for a long time and it took me going. but it was uh it was read read until your head spins watch movies until your heart races and write your ass off. <laughs> okay. Great. And, and I also personally just wanted to thank the actors tonight. I thought that they were fantastic. It was really great. Thank you. Oh yeah, also uh, Casey, Joanne, uh, I wanna give you a special shout out for being uh, understudied, ready to go to play a uh, 20 something romantic lead. <laughs> what I do, <laughs> <laughs> ready to go. Very good. Let's go back to our uh, widescreen here. What do we got? Uh, uh, Wayne, uh, any final words before we wrap this up? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I just want to thank everybody for participating. Uh, the writers that uh, were here tonight, the other writers that actually participated and sent their scripts in, the actors, everybody that worked so hard to make this the success it is. I want to remind everybody that uh, since 2008, Mike and I have hosted a bi-weekly writer's workshop. Uh, it's open to any writer anywhere. Uh, we try to do table reads, criticism, uh, uh, blue skying, idea kicking around, whatever is necessary. Uh, Jason has been there. Joanne's been there. Sean's been there. You know, we've had a, we've had a pretty good turnout. Uh, we've done something like this. Uh, since the lockdown. Uh, and Mike has set up uh, a Skype call that we dial into. And, um, oh, there's the thing. <laughs> and um, that we all can participate in and we, we, we share our scripts within a, within a special Dropbox we have set up and we do 
just like the table reads we've done here. We read people's scripts like that. We talk about them. We maybe bring some education into it. So if you're interested, tomorrow night is the next one. It's from six to eight. And uh, normally it's at Carlson Cowork in Rochester, but since the, the quarantine, since the coronavirus, we've been doing a Skype phone call. Yes, and, and I, have the, uh, I have the details for that on uh, Rochester Writers Workshop website. That's rwwny.org. Um, and I've got the, uh, the link there to, uh, to get on my Skype list. Um, I do it on Skype because I was using Skype before Zoom uh, and it's worked out pretty well for us. Um, and uh, yeah, that's tomorrow night at six o'clock for any uh, aspiring writers or if you just wanna hear what other people are writing. Um, Okay, Wayne? That's it for me. I think we're good. So <laughs> once again, thanks to, uh, did you thank Script Studio, our sponsor? Uh, I'd like to say thank you to them. Uh, thanks to Joanne and Sean and all of our writers and all of our actors. Um, I think this was a, a fun time. And uh, this is gonna be uh, on uh, YouTube for a little while we'll, before we uh, uh, archive it um, for the future. Um, but uh, yeah, if you wanna send, your friends and family to uh, parts of this to, to to watch it in the upcoming weeks. You can, and uh, thank you everyone for uh, participating. Good night. Right. It was a good time. Have thank a safe trip home. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. <laughs> Bye now.